So this um, this week I was writing, yeah, my what what would drop it on my heart, and, and I usually start before I do anything, I start with worship, and I like worshiping when I'm by myself because nobody gets to hear it and nobody has to hear it. <laughs> There's a double benefit in that, but you know, Thank you. I, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's totally fine to do that because I was going to say. Anyways, um, I opened up the blinds in the library and I was looking over because I don't like staring at a wall. But when you like, I, I was just looking out as I was singing out a song, and it is beautiful out. And you realize, like, when the snow comes, the snow can be annoying, but also it makes everything that is ugly beautiful. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how much garbage you've stored in your yard, it's a snow mountain now, okay? That looks white and beautiful, and it's like, ah. Oh. Anyways, I was looking out, and, and all I heard was God saying in the middle of worship was a sweet smell. So... That, in that moment, I was like, okay, I want to know more. Why would you just, that, that one line, it just stood in my head. Like, it, there was no cohesiveness, you know what I mean? Like, when you have your own thoughts, and then you, like, think of something, then you can say, okay, that was of me. But when you're in worship, and you're doing your thing, and all of a sudden, you just hear a sweet smell. Like, kind of like somebody's saying that out of the left-right side, and you're just like, okay, what the heck is that supposed to mean? So I went into my Germanness and started dissecting this. Um, a sweet smell. So I started with smell. We have the sense of smell, some do, most do. And it is incredibly powerful. So like, when you walk into a room and you smell fresh baked cookies, do you go like, oh, what a day. <laughs> most of you will be like, I want more of that. Like, I want to eat it now, you know, and it, but it creates a mood, it actually changes our mood, it has an influence on how we feel. Just that, ah, fresh bacon, I don't know what it is for you, or for some that's like lifting, you know, the barbecue lid and just smelling that steak sizzling, you know. Any ever experienced that? Or is that like, oh, what a bummer, <laughs> trying to eat steak, woe is me. Um, so, I looked at smell. Smell is actually the only sense that bypasses our, our body's relay system. So usually things come in and then they get spread out. But smell goes directly to two different things. One is memory. It goes straight to your memory. That's why we always feel nostalgic when we smell the, certain things. I'll tell you this, like, it was so random. I smelled my dad's cologne. He has a very specific cologne. And my mom would order it in and get it shipped in. So I never smell it. And randomly, I, I think... I was saying, Vancouver or something? I smelled my dad's cologne, and it made me want to cry. You know, because smell has power. And I was like, instantly, memories of my dad, like, it's not like you can control it. It comes, and poof, this cascade happens in your brain. Or, the opposite. You smell a threat, like the smell of smoke. You know, you know that, well, for Justin, that's hallelujah, something in smoke, getting smoked. He likes smoke, so he'd be happy. But for some of us, it goes towards, like, maybe there's a fire, you know, and danger. So our, like, our smell will either go to our memory or to it, there's a threat. And it bypasses everything else to instantly go to those places. You know, why a sweet smell? Actually, in the Old Testament, you will read about a sweet smell. You actually read about it in the New Testament in three different scriptures, which we'll look at. But in the Old Testament, we see God's response to smell. So I'll start in Genesis chapter 8. If you have your Bible, open it up. So we're going to go to the book of Genesis, chapter 8, verse 21. Somebody say amen when you get there, so I know you're there. Actually, I'm going to read from verse 20. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is after they um, went out of the ark. Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird 
and offered burnt, burnt offerings on the altar. And then verse 21, it says, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And out of that, then the Lord said, In his heart, I will never again curse the ground of man's sake, although the imagination of, uh, imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor I will again destroy every living thing as I have done. That burnt offering that God smelled, that he received, it was a soothing aroma to him. There's different scriptures in Exodus and Leviticus where it talks about three different things, actually four different things that kept getting uh, burnt as offerings to God. Meat, then there's bread, there's a drink offering, and then there is spices, fragrances like frankincense. And all, <laughs> Cindy's happy over there. <laughs> Anybody ever like smell a fresh loaf of bread and was like, oh, that smells terrible. <laughs> Usually there's somebody with a wooden spoon waiting to swap at your hand while you go for the bread. <laughs> Ever experienced that? Mm, that yeah, anyways. Uh, well, I'll be soon. Um, so you have meat, you have bread, you have drink, you have spices. These are all smells that are pleasing to God. Which I thought, like, God... When I, okay, so I didn't grow up like farming and animals around and butchering and all that kind of stuff. So to me that was always like when I would read the Old Testament and God delights in the sacrifice of an animal and there's like blood sprayed on the altar and like, and then it says like, and God was really pleased. And God was just like, had a sweet smelling aroma and I was like, that is cruel. Okay, God, like what the heck? That is not what I would think is like a sweet aroma in my nose. And you know what? In those sacrifices, often God gave restrictions. He said, bring me a bull without blemish. Not just a bull. Not just grab whatever bull you find, drag him over. No, I want your best one. I want the one without any blemish. So I started looking into what is a sacrifice. Because you know, often... We're very literal people. We read there was a sacrifice, there was a burnt offering, he smelled it, that was the good part. But why was that a good part? Now, in the old days, a sacrifice represented two different things. The killing of the animal was death. That is the penalty that they deserved for their crime. That is their understanding in their Jewish custom that my penalty for the crime and the sin that I commit against God, my due penalty is death. So the death of the animal, animal represents what should happen to me. The giving of blood is the source of life. If, it, if you had no more blood inside of you, you can have all your organs working, but you're yeah. dead. Because you need it. It's your, it was, keeps circulating, and if it stops circulating, that's, that's it, guys. That's, so the shedding of the blood was a giving of life, the surrendering of life. You know, so basically, I think why God says this is a sweet-smelling aroma is because somebody is saying, like, hey, God, I understand that the way I am living, the sin that I carry in my life, is a stench in your nose. It is, I personally deserve death for the wrong that I have done on this planet. I'm going to come to you and sacrifice this and saying, Lord, I don't want to go where that leads me. There's a heart of repentance in that. And I think when we burn it, and when we're willing to give up our best bull. Now, any of you ever raised a bull? You probably have over there. Is it cheap? No. No. Giving up your best one that you might, usually people have bulls to breed. Like my grandpa, Olivia's grandparents, they have a farm and they have one bull for their whole farm. Because he was expensive. He was a pristine bull raised so that they could have a good line of meat coming from him. Now God's saying, bring me the bull without blemish. It's basically saying, pluck out your best bull and bring it to me. That is costly. I don't think anybody leads their bull to the slaughter and was like, today we're going to set this bull. You know? I don't think there was an excitement about that. But there was an understanding that this is worth it. To bring my livelihood or to bring something of that big of value, I'm going to sacrifice it because I understood 
where I should have been. And I think that is why God delighted over it. Because the continuous issue of the Israelites was what? Their hearts turned away from God. When you bring a sacrifice to God, your heart is turning where? It's turning to God. That is the whole thing that makes it so sweet smelling. Is when we turn our lives back to saying, okay, actually, I need to correct. I need to repent. I need to lay down my life on that altar. And we know of it more than they did in the back, back in those days because they only had the law. You get like the whole New Testament. So we're going to dive into that as well. The New Testament... <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me. The New Testament has three scriptures that talk about a sweet smell. I'm just going to choose which one I go to first. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to start right in the beginning, in verse 1, and go on from there. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Jesus was our sacrifice. Now, that goes even one further. That was even harder for me in some sense to say that God felt that Jesus as a sacrifice was a sweet-smelling aroma. The cost of his son being sacrificed on the altar was a sweet-smelling aroma. That's what God received because of you and I, his love for every single person. We have to understand that that sacrifice of death, that shedding of blood, and you know, I'm so happy that actually today we're celebrating communion. I was like, as I wrote this, I was like, ah, oh, good, it's the first Sunday of the month. We're going to have communion. Because you're going to enjoy that. Because God gave, Jesus gave himself as your sacrifice. He is the one that says, I'm going on the altar for you. He is the one that we are leading. And I think we need to understand that you and I are the ones that led Jesus to that altar. Yeah, you weren't alive, but the sins of your life, the things that you have committed before you've known God, those are the things that led him to the cross. I think often because it doesn't feel good, we want to separate ourselves from that. Like Jesus died before I was born, so I don't really have to feel bad that Jesus died because it wasn't because I was there and caused that. But actually what our understanding of salvation needs to be that we were under the same penalty. That the things that we have done, where we have crossed and went against God's law, law and order and what God has actually asked us to do. All the things when we have lied or when we've cheated or some of us have cut people down. Like I know for myself how many people have I with my sarcasm hurt in my life. I might not ever get to know that, but I know there's, a, there's something for that. If I speak death, if I cut somebody down, that is not pleasing to my God. And I don't want that. So I have to understand that my actions and the way I live my life is part of leading Christ to the cross. You know, in the way it is written, it says sacrifice, but actually in the Greek, it is the proper sacrifice. If you read through Leviticus, different sins had different severity of offerings. Some was a bull, some went down to a dove. There was, some was just flour. So there is different levels of what the sacrifice looked like. But in Scripture, in Ephesians, it says that Jesus was the proper sacrifice that could bring atonement for you and I. There is nothing else that would fit that. You couldn't have just brought a bull. It had to be him to, to bring that kind of salvation for all of us. It couldn't just be a bull 
had to be God's only son. It had to be God himself coming down here. This is why we celebrate Christmas. This is this whole season from Christmas to Easter is to remind us how blessed you and I are. That God, that Jesus decided to come here, walk on this earth, share about his kingdom, and then be a sacrifice for you and I. A sweet-smelling aroma. It's not easy, you know. We read about Romans and to be a living sacrifice. Have you ever read that scripture? <clears throat> You've heard the scripture? To be a living sacrifice means we have to over and over and over decide to lay our life on the altar to you. If you want to be a sweet smell to God, this is what I took out of it. I, God, want to be a sweet-smelling aroma to you. I want to have a life that isn't a stench. It talked about, actually, um, when Moses the first time went to the Pharaoh and told him, like, hey, let my people go, you know? And then he said no. And then they came back, and then the Pharaoh was really mad and said, I'm going to increase the yoke that I've already put on the Israelites. And he did. And do you know what the people of Israel said to Moses? Why have you made us a stench in a Pharaoh's life? Now we are in a greater hardship. Our life, we can be a stench or we can be a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, actually, I believe that Moses was a sweet-smelling aroma to God as he's willing to go into the Pharaoh's house and let him know that he needs to let the Israelites go. They maybe didn't recognize that. But the way we live our lives, we are living it according to one person who gave his life. You know, often it's easier to try to live life, I, sometimes I'm even in that boat, where I try to live a good life for my family. I try to provide and do the best that I can for my family, which is not a bad thing, per se. But if that takes precedence over where God is in my life, if I actually focus more on creating a good family life versus surrendering myself to God and what He has called me to do, I don't know what kind of smell I am in His nose. I don't know if he's going to be like, ah, Robin. Or if he's going to be like, whoa, Robin. I've heard my wife say that before. Whoa, Robin. Don't leave your soccer shoes laying around. You know, in 2 Corinthians, it gives us something sobering, too. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 to 15. 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 to 15. Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ, among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? When we walk out our faith in Christ, when we are committing ourselves to hear his call and lay down our life for Christ, we're going to have a fragrance, not just to God, but to the world as well. It is saying, it is a smell, that it gives life, I'm going to read that because I'm going to butcher it, the one, um, to the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. How can you be two things at the same time? You give up one aroma to another believer who, who sees Christ's work in you, who sees how committed you are to following and living for Him. 
It will be a sweet smell. Have you ever been encouraged by another believer just being on fire for God? That person is also quick to share about God and who God is, not just to other believers, but also to the people around them. Is that a smell of life if you have rejected God? Most people understand the concept that there is going to be a judgment day and that there's going to be heaven, and even if they don't like it, there's also the other place. There's also hell. There's also another place where you go when you don't believe. So they look at us and think, you're just judging me. But actually, we aren't the ones that are judges. The smell, the way we live our life, actually will bring that out in them. Because they understand there is more. So that's why it says that to the death, it's leading to death. Don't be afraid of letting your fragrance come out. You know, in our modern world, we don't like our natural like, you know, fragrance to come out. You know, we, we kind of like, we try to kind of wash it away, put deodorant on, put shampoo in because our natural, we kind of try to make it socially acceptable. Don't let your faith be like that. Don't treat your faith like B.O. Okay? <laughs> like, oh, let's quickly wash that off and put some deodorant over because I don't really want people to smell that. I don't want to have something that is a stench in their nose. It's actually a great analogy. I'm like super happy right now because I didn't write that down. That is good. <laughs> so, you know? So as you walk around, and if even if you get a whiff of your own BO after you worked all day, be like, oh, what's my Christian fragrance? What's my spiritual fragrance today? You know, what do I smell like to you, God? How am I walking on this earth? Am I actually pleasing to you? If that's not a concern for you, then that's a problem. It should be important to you of how God sees you. And how you walk with him. Because he actually, in 2 Corinthians, says that we are victorious. Did you start? But that whole thing started with, we are victorious. We are triumphant. We know where we're going. We know that at the end of the day, we can let our fragrance out. Because we know where we're going. If it bothers some, let it bother them. Now, don't take it about B.O., but take it about your spiritual aroma. Don't let that be a bother to you if somebody doesn't like the way you follow Christ. Don't let it bother you because they're actually offended at God. They're rejecting God. They're not rejecting you. They're not saying you're not good enough. They might verbally say that, but they're having a total different internal battle. Let your fragrance out. You know, I remember at Value Village when I was the manager there, I struggled with letting my fragrance out. I really did, because I was the manager. And I always wanted to, like, in your head, you're trying to, you know, be credible as a manager. But man, I had ideas that I can't claim to have been mine. They just came and they worked out really great. And then you get compliments. And I realized, as I worked there longer and longer, how often do you think I gave credit to God in front of these people? They complimented me on a good idea. I didn't. Now you can shake your head at me because I'm a pastor today, but go ahead. Um, I didn't. And it, it bothers me. It bothers me that I was so afraid of letting out my own fragrance, my thankfulness to God, because I thanked Him. I would drive home and be like, man, Lord, I know that was you. Thank you for helping me. But in that moment, something held me back from actually releasing my fragrance. I just took another deodorant stick and just slapped everything over top and said, no, this is not happening. It's silly, because we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of how we look to other people. But then also, God doesn't get to smell us. He doesn't get to be like, that soothing aroma of, wow, that's my son. That is my daughter, walking out the way I called him to, or her. Does that make sense? We live in a day where we kind of don't want to let out our smell, but we need to be letting out our fragrance in this world. You know, when Olivia shared about me with God, it was not a sweet swelling aroma. Okay, when she started telling me about good, how the goodness of God and Jesus Christ and all these different things, and we argued, she was not a sweet swelling aroma. But God has a way of changing that. It is a smell that leaves residue. 
and it just, it irks you. And that's a good thing. You know, we live in a world where we don't want to offend people, but that's actually not that bad. You know, sometimes saying something truthful that will offend them, you can just leave it. Because you don't have to carry that with you. But sometimes you still need to just say the truth. You know, Landon, uh, who's a pastor of Women Christian Fellowship, he the other day said, like, hey, Robin, I talked to you about, uh, about you in my last sermon. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> can't go in a good place right now. <laughs> Usually I'm not used as positive examples. But he said, um, everybody needs a German in their life. <laughs> so I was still on the fence with what that meant. Okay? Because <laughs> again, that could go really bad. Um, but he's like, there's a directness that we're sometimes afraid of. That some people bring with them. And I think he was just thinking that, you know, often I'm very unfiltered. And, but... It's not that I don't care about people, and also that I can go in a bad direction, so don't just take that as the greatest example of life. But it is also good to be not afraid of speaking the truth and letting it stand. You know, one thing you get taught about a sermon is to say it, then don't try to convince them. So you say the truth, and you let the truth do its own work. You're not going to beat around the same line for 15 hours till everybody says yes and amen. Because we all have to grapple with truth. We all have to fight with truth. But I want you to fight with me about truth, and I want you to fight with God about truth. Does that make sense? So if I'm the one chewing through it and fighting for it, I'm going to be your opponent. I don't want to be your opponent. I want you to take the truth that God reveals to you, and I want you to take it to God himself. So you can wrestle with him. Now there's one thing that, we're, the, the last scripture in the New Testament that talks about aroma is in Philippians, chapter 4, verse So this is going in a little bit of a different direction, but it is the same. The last scripture is Philippians chapter 4, 4 verse 18. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Aphrodites the things um, sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all you need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It was talking about actually aid. He was talking about actually being supported and taken care of. And that that was a sweet, sweet smelling aroma to God. There's a, a thing that we do and it's called generosity. You know, what I've noticed in our community, that us doing a soup kitchen, us not charging anything, we haven't even asked anybody for money for it either. We haven't done anything except open it up and fed some people. That to God, that kind of generosity is a sweet-smelling aroma. When we just walk that out, we don't ask for something. We just walk it out in obedience. You hear that we were, we clearly, you know, when we prayed about a soup kitchen, and weeks later, we were approached and said, like, hey, we have a building that, you know, we could lease to you guys. Oh, where is it? Oh, it's in NW, right on the highway beside the liquor store. And I found out across from us is a huge low-income um, building complex. We're right in the right spot. How do you not think that is God when you get your hands on something like that? So why would we stop walking in faith that this is God's? It is a sweet-smelling aroma to our community. Do you know how many people have reached out to me? It was like, man, this is a great thing. This is so awesome. How can we help? Because there's something that invigorates them about it. And they get to come, and they're coming, and we're in communication and a relationship. And then they ask, well, why? Well, you know what's great about the soup kitchen? When somebody asks why we're doing it, there's only one person you can point it back at. Because I didn't organize the building. I didn't build the roads to Enderby. I didn't raise... You know what I mean? 
There was God opening door after door. And you can see how awkward that is for the one listening to it. Because some of them were thinking, like, who had this great idea about being, like, nice to the poor people, you know? But actually, it was God who inspired the idea. Amen. And it puts them into, now, I can easily go in that place and try to wrestle with them about that. Or, I can leave that truth right there. And let them wrestle with that truth. Because it is truth. Yeah. God provided that building. Someone prayed, heard the word soup kitchen, asked if we needed that building, boom, we have a soup kitchen. Mm -hmm. So our generosity, when we give without a hook, without expect expectation of receiving something back, when we just freely give and we are generous in this world, it's a sweet smelling aroma. <laughs> I, to this day, can tell you about an orphanage that I went to in the Ukraine. There's two. One was funded by our church that was an incredible building, and they lacked nothing. And then they, out of their abundance, are helping out a smaller orphanage that has nothing. Like, they don't have a toilet. Their toilet is a slab of concrete with a hole in it, and a roll of toilet paper beside it. That is what they live in. That is their, and that's a separate building. So in the winter, guess what? No heated seats. Anyways. When I went there, they invited us to come and see their place. They invited us to stay for lunch. Do you know what the table looked like that I went to? We talk a big, long table, and we were four <coughs> men that liked to eat. And I, they must have known that. There was everything. There was all sorts of dishes prepared. There was mushrooms. There was, like, it was a feast, and it looked as of abundance. And later I asked, like, why did they serve us so much? Like, do they just have that much? They have been working for weeks, knowing that we're coming, going into the forest, collecting ingredients, rolling out the dough, doing the Like, they did everything by hand. There was no, oh, oh people are coming, let's go to Costco and, like, buy bulk this and throw it in their, like, you know, hot water, and then we'll serve that. No, they took time to prepare all this food for us. You know what's funny? They didn't know us. You know what's also funny? We didn't actually support that orphanage. We supported the other one. They kind of just were blessed by a little bit of the splash of that. But they treated us with such love and generosity. And then we left, and I've never been back. But that sweet-smelling aroma affected me. Their generosity, their willingness to like work so they can serve me one meal that is at the heart of Christ. It reminds me of Christ being willing to wash his disciples' feet, becoming the lowest of servants. That's what it reminded me of. Now, we live in a little bit of an entitled community and culture. Okay? We do. It is not a joke. We are around where, like, you know, just because we're here, we somehow deserve something. That's not true. We are here because God created us. And we're here for a purpose. And if we actually bring that right back to Him and sacrifice ourselves, lay ourselves down, it says that the death of an animal, animal stood for the death that we deserved, and the blood is the life that flowed out of that animal. Is our life flowing towards Him? And are we willing to actually put to, self our, uh, to, put to death our own flesh in the process? This morning during pre-service prayer, Justin felt like sharing about our willingness. Are we willing? It starts right there. It's not about just walking out of Christian faith. It's the willingness to pursue God, to walk with Him, and to do what He asks us to do, no matter the cost. So, I'm going to close with this. What do you smell like? I want you to think about this week. What do you smell like? Not just your physical smell, but your spiritual smell. How is God <coughs> receiving your smell? That's my challenge. That's my challenge to myself and what I do. God, how? What do you see? What do you smell? Is it pleasing to you? Which is a great tie over into communion, which we're going to do now. And Jack, maybe you'll help me serve that up. 
But as you partake in communion today, you remember he paid for the death and he gave that life. The blood and the, the bread for his body and the wine for his blood. That is his sacrifice for you. What's your smell? How are you going to respond to that? So I want to invite you to just come up as we're going to get set up. Take a piece of the bread, which is his body. Take a cup of his blood. Why? Which is his blood. It's not his blood. It is. And partake. And ask him. Maybe even just take a moment to thank him for what he's done. And then ask him, God, what does it smell like to you? Amen.